Hi, boys and girls. Welcome back. We are at the second to last chapter. I cannot believe we have read this entire book. I actually realized the other day that I started reading these out loud at chapter three. So we're today doing our 20th chapter of these out loud. It's been really fun for me to read it out loud to you guys. And I know right now we don't have everybody actively reading along with us, but I hope those of you who are really reading and paying attention, and I hope you're really getting something out of this. The great thing about this book is that even though the premise is so outlandish, like he created a person from nothing and there's this monster and all this murder, the heart of it is really relatable, right? It's this guy who got so wrapped up in something that he probably shouldn't have, and now he's dealing with the consequences and sometimes facing the consequences of our actions, even if they're not this big, right? Even if they're small, even if they're having to go to Miss Hudson or losing privileges with your phone, having to face the consequences of your actions teaches you so much about the world and so much about yourself. And I think that seeing Victor face this hurdle, this consequence, these constant consequences of this big kind of mistake he made of abandoning the monster, not even really of creating it, but abandoning it. He has to face the consequences of that every day. And I think seeing him do that kind of reminds me of times when I've been weak in the face of adversity. And I learn a lot from the way that Victor handles it. And we'll talk a little bit about that in this chapter and that he's not a good example of how to solve your problems or how to deal with your problems or how to communicate your problems to others. He kind of closes off and tries to deal with all of it by himself, which is a huge mistake again, right? So he's kind of piling consequences on consequences. But all of that to say, that was a big ramble. All of that to say, the reason I love this book is because you can apply it to your life, even though it's a crazy premise. And I think that means Mary Shelley was a really smart young woman because she knew she could write this really outlandish story, but still make it relatable to people. 300 years later, right? And I think that that's something just really amazing. And so thank you, those of you who are sticking with me. Like I've said in every video, this is a really tough book. And if you're listening and answering the questions and sticking with it, you are doing more than most eighth graders in the country, but definitely most eighth graders in this state. You are killing it. So I'm very proud of you. I'm going to jump into chapter 23 pretty quickly, but before we do, I do have a warning up at the top here of your assignment, and just in general, I'm going to say it again. This has one of the more severe descriptions of death, so you guys kind of knew a murder was on the horizon, judging by the last chapter. This one's a little bit more graphic, now graphic in way back terms, not in today's terms, but he does have a more detailed description of the death. In the video, I'll pause before that section and make a note of it. And also in the text, there's a note to tell you, like, this is the part that's a little bit more, I guess, graphic is the best word. So I'll pause. Please, if you're going to listen to the chapter and you need to skip that section, please feel free to do so. If you just feel like you don't even want to risk it and you want to skip this chapter entirely, I totally understand. Just blow right past it, and I'll summarize the events at the top of the next chapter's video. Okay, so if it's just something either right now or in general you don't want to deal with, you don't want to put in your mind, please feel free to skip it, okay? And again, I'll pause before that section starts. It's most important to take care of yourself first, right? We can read whatever we want to read, um, but the most important thing is that you're taking care of yourself. So, with that being said, where did we leave off? The end of chapter 22, Victor and Elizabeth have gotten married and they're on their way to their honeymoon in Italy. Now remember, Victor's very anxious about this trip because the last time that he saw the monster, well, spoke to the monster, the monster said, I'll be with you on your wedding night. So Victor knows the monster's coming. Excuse me. He's always held up his little bargains his threats so he knows the monster is going to be there so he's just anticipating it so that's where we're picking up it is their wedding night Ooh. it is their wedding night so that's where we're picking up uh, before you start reading make sure you answer the poll i said someone will die in this chapter who do you think will die 
Let's find out. All right, let's start this read aloud, shall we? I know I ramble so much. Okay. Frankenstein, Chapter 23, by Mary Shelley. It was eight o'clock when we landed. We walked for a short time on the shore, enjoying the transitory night, and then retired to the end and contemplated the lovely scene of waters, woods, and mountains, obscured in darkness, yet still displaying their black outlines. The wind, which had fallen in the south, now rose with great violence in the west. The moon had reached her summit in the heavens and was beginning to descend. The clouds swept across it swifter than the flight of the vulture and dimmed her rays, while the lake reflected the scene of the busy heavens, rendered still busier by the restless waves that were beginning to rise. Suddenly, a heavy storm of rain descended. I had been calm during the day, but so soon as night obscured the shapes of objects, a thousand fears arose in my mind. I was anxious and watchful while my right hand grasped a pistol which was hidden in my bosom. Every sound terrified me, but I resolved that I would sell my life dearly and not shrink from the conflict until my own life or that of my adversary was extinguished. Elizabeth observed my agitation for some time in timid and fearful silence, but there was something in my glance which communicated terror to her, and trembling she asked, what is it that agitates you, my dear Victor? What is it you fear? Oh, peace, peace, my love, replied I. This night, and all will be safe, but this night is dreadful, very dreadful. I passed an hour in this state of mine when suddenly I reflected how fearful the combat which I momentarily expected would be to my wife, and I earnestly entreated her to retire, resolving not to join her until I had obtained some knowledge as to the situation of my enemy. She left me, and I continued some time walking up and down the passages of the house and inspecting every corner that might afford a retreat to my adversary, but I discovered no trace of him and was beginning to conjecture that some fortunate chance had intervened to prevent the execution of his menaces, when suddenly I heard a shrill and dreadful scream. It came from the room into which Elizabeth had retired. As I heard it, the whole truth rushed into my mind. My arms dropped. The motion of every muscle and fiber was suspended. I could feel the blood trickling in my veins and tingling in the extremities of my limbs. This state lasted but for an instant. The scream was repeated, and I rushed into the room. This next chapter, this next paragraph is going to be the one that's a little intense. Excuse me. Great God, why did I not then expire? Why am I here to relate the destruction of the best hope and the purest creature on earth? She was there, lifeless and inanimate thrown across the bed, her head hanging down and her pale and distorted features half covered by her hair. Everywhere I turn, I see the same figure, her bloodless arms and relaxed form flung by the murderer on its bridal bier. Could I behold this and live? Alas, life is obstinate and clings closest to where it is most hated. For a moment only did I lose recollection. I fell senseless on the ground. When I recovered, I found myself surrounded by the people of the inn. Their countenances expressed a breathless terror, but the horror of others appeared only as a mockery, a shadow of the feelings that oppressed me. I escaped from them to the room where lay the body of Elizabeth, my love, my wife, so lately living, so dear, so worthy. She had been moved from the posture in which I had first beheld her, and now as she lay, her head upon her arm and a handkerchief thrown across her face and neck, I might have supposed her asleep. I rushed towards her and embraced her with ardor, but the deadly languor and coldness of the limbs told me that what I now held in my arms had ceased to be the Elizabeth whom I had loved and cherished. The murderous mark of the fiend's grasp was on her neck and the breath had ceased to issue from her lips. While I was still hung over her in the agony of despair, I happened to look up. 
The windows of the room had before been darkened, and I felt a kind of panic on seeing the pale yellow light of the moon illuminate the chamber. The shutters had been thrown back, and with a sensation of horror not to be described, I saw at the open window a figure the most hideous and abhorred. A grin was on the face of the monster. He seemed to jeer, as with his fiendish finger he pointed towards the corpse of my wife. I rushed toward the window, and drawing a pistol from my bosom, fired. But he eluded me, leaped from his station, and running with the swiftness of lightning, plunged into the lake. The report of the pistol brought a crowd into the room. I pointed to the spot where he had disappeared, and we followed the track with boats. Nets were cast, but in vain. After passing several hours, we returned hopeless. Most of my companions believing it to have been a form conjured up by my fancy. After having landed, they proceeded to search the country, parties going in different directions among the woods and vines. I attempted to accompany them and proceeded a short distance from the house, but my head whirled round. My steps were like those of a drunken man. I fell at last in a state of utter exhaustion. A film covered my eyes and my skin was parched with the heat of fever. In this state, I was carried back and placed on a bed, hardly conscious of what had happened. My eyes wandered round the room as if to seek something that I had lost. After an interval, I arose and as if by instinct crawled into the room where the corpse of my beloved lay. There were women weeping round. I hung over it and joined my sad tears to theirs. All this time, no distinct idea presented itself to my mind, but my thoughts rambled to various subjects, reflecting confusedly on my misfortunes and their cause. I was bewildered in a cloud of wonder and horror. The death of William, the execution of Justine, the murder of Clerval, and lastly, of my wife. Even at that moment, I knew not that my only remaining friends were safe from the malignity of the fiend. My father, even now, might be writhing under his grasp, and Ernest might be dead at his feet. This idea made me shudder and recalled me to action. I started up and resolved to return to Geneva with all possible speed. There were no horses to be procured, and I must return by lake, but the wind was unfavorable and the rain fell in torrents. However, it was hardly morning, and I might reasonably hope to arrive by night. I hired men to row and took an oar myself, for I had always experienced relief from mental torment in body exercise, in bodily exercise. But the overflowing misery I now felt, and the excess of agitation that I endured, rendered me incapable of any exertion. I threw down the oar, and leaning my head upon my hands, gave way to every gloomy idea that arose. If I looked up, I saw scenes which were familiar to me in my happier time, and which I had contemplated, but the day before in the company of her, who was now but a shadow and a recollection. Tears streamed from my eyes. The rain had ceased for a moment, and I saw the fish play in the waters as they had done a few hours before. They had then been observed by Elizabeth. Nothing is so painful to the human mind as a great and sudden change. The sun might shine or the clouds might lower, but nothing could appear to me as it had done the day before. A fiend had snatched from me every hope of future happiness. No creature had ever been so miserable as I was. So frightful an event is single in the history of man. But why should I dwell upon the incidents that followed this last overwhelming event? Mine has been a tale of horrors. I have reached their acme, and what I must now relate can be but tedious to you. Know that, one by one, my friends were snatched away. I was left desolate. My own strength is exhausted, and I must tell in a few words what remains of my hideous narration. I arrived at Geneva. My father and Ernest yet lived, but the former sunk under the tidings that I bore. I see him now, excellent and venerable old man. His eyes wandered in vacancy, for they had lost their charm and their delight. His Elizabeth, his more than daughter, 
whom he doted on with all that affection which a man feels, who in the decline of life, having few affections, clings more earnestly to those that remain. Cursed, cursed be the fiend that brought misery on his gray hairs and doomed him to waste in wretchedness. He could not live under the horrors that were accumulated around him. The springs of existence suddenly gave way. He was unable to rise from his bed, and in a few days he died in my arms. What then became of me? I know not. I lost sensation, and chains and darkness were the only objects that pressed upon me. Sometimes, indeed, I dreamt that I wandered in flowery meadows and pleasant vales with the, with the friends of my youth, but I awoke and found myself in a dungeon. Melancholy followed, but by degrees I gained a clear conception of my miseries and situation and was then released from my prison. For they had called me mad, and during many months, as I understood, a solitary cell had been my habitation. Liberty, however, had been a useless gift to me. Had I not, as I awakened to reason, at the same time awakened to revenge, as the memory of past misfortunes pressed upon me, I began to reflect on their cause. The monster whom I had created, the miserable demon whom I had sent abroad into the world for my destruction. I was possessed by a maddening rage when I thought of him, and desired and ardently prayed that I might have him within my grasp to wreak a great and single revenge on his cursed head. Nor did my hate long confine itself to useless wishes. I began to reflect on the best means of securing him, and for this purpose, about a month after my release, I repaired to a criminal judge in the town and told him that I had an accusation to make, and that I knew the destroyer of my family, and that I re required him to exert his whole authority for the apprehension of the murderer. The magistrate listened to me with attention and kindness. Be assured, sir, said he, no pains or exertions on my part shall be spared to discover the villain. I thank you, replied I. Listen, therefore, to the deposition that I have to make. It is indeed a tale so strange that I should fear you would not credit it were there not something in truth which, however wonderful, forces conviction. The story is too connected to be mistaken for a dream, and I have no motive for falsehood. My manner as I thus addressed him was impressive but calm. I had formed in my own heart a resolution to pursue my destroyer to death, and this purpose quieted my agony and for an interval reconciled me to life. I now related my history briefly, but with firmness and precision, making the dates with accuracy and never deviating into invective or exclamation. The magistrate of appeared at first perfectly incredulous, but as I continued, he became more attentive and interested. I saw him sometimes shudder with horror, at others a lively surprise, unmingled with disbelief, was painted on his countenance. When I had concluded my narration, I said, this is the being whom I accuse, and for whose seizure and punishment I call upon you to exert your whole power. It is your duty as a magistrate, and I believe and hope that your feelings as a man will not revolt from the execution of those functions on this occasion. This address caused a considerable change in the physiognomy. Physiognomy? This is an old word. This address caused a considerable change in the body language of my own auditor. He had heard my story with that half kind of belief that is given to a tale of spirits and supernatural events. But when he was called upon to act officially in consequence, the whole tide of his incredulity returned. He, however, answered mildly, I would willingly afford you every aid in your pursuit. But the creature of whom you speak appears to have powers which would put all my exertions to defiance. Who can follow an animal which can traverse the sea of ice and inhabit caves and dens where no man would venture to intrude? Besides, some months have elapsed since the commission of his crimes, and no one can conjecture to what place he has wandered or what region he may now inhabit. I do not doubt that he hovers near the spot which I inhabit. And if he has indeed taken refuge in the Alps, he may be hunted like the chamois and destroyed as a beast of prey. 
but I perceive your thoughts. You do not credit my narrative and do not intend to pursue my enemy with the punishment which is his desert. As I spoke, rage sparkled in my eyes. The magistrate was intimidated. You are mistaken, said he. I will exert myself. And if it is in my power to seize the monster, be assured that he shall suffer punishment proportionate to his crimes. But I fear from what you have yourself described to be his properties, that this will prove impracticable. And thus, while every proper measure is pursued, you should make your mind up to disappointment. That cannot be, but all that I can say will be of little avail. My revenge is of no moment to you, yet while I allow it to be a vice, I confess that it is the devouring and only passion of my soul. My rage is unspeakable when I reflect that the murderer whom I have turned loose upon society still exists. You refuse my just demand. I have but one resource and I devote myself either in my life or death to his destruction. I trembled with excessive agitation as I said this. There was a frenzy in my manner and something I doubt not of that haughty fierceness which the martyrs of old are said to have possessed. But to a Genevan magistrate, whose mind was occupied by far other ideas than those of devotion and heroism, this elevation of mind had much the appearance of madness. He endeavored to soothe me as a nurse does a child, and reverted to my tale as the effects of delirium. Man, I cried, how ignorant art thou in thy pride of wisdom. Cease! You know not what it is you say. I broke from the house angry and disturbed and retired to meditate on some other mode of action. The end of chapter 23. We've only got one chapter left. Can you believe it? Okay. Woo! Chapter 22. Um, okay, this is the moment we've all been waiting for. Even, it's funny because Victor even says it her, himself. He says, like, I've gotten to the climax of my story. He calls it Acme, but or acme, but that's just another term for the climax. And he even says that himself, like, I've gotten to the conflict of the story. I'm here now, finally. So let's go back. We are at the climax of the story. What has happened? What has happened? What has happened? It's so crazy. Okay. So they get to Italy, right? Everything's going okay, except Victor's like, on edge. And Elizabeth says, what's wrong? And he says, this is going to be the worst night of our life which I made a little note. If your husband says that to you on the day of your wedding, that is not good. So anyway, he says, it's going to be the worst night of our life. It's going to be dreadful. And he starts to have this thought, like when the monster comes to get me, that's going to really traumatize Elizabeth. It's going to really put some fear in her. So Elizabeth, why don't you go to bed? Big mistake, right? Huge mistake because what happens? The monster slides into the bedroom probably through a window or whatever he's a monster under the bed um and he strangles her and kills her so for some reason this thought never crossed victor's mind and i have a pretty good feeling that it probably crossed all of your minds because you saw that great foreshadowing that mary shelley was laying down right it's a pattern the monster doesn't kill victor because victor is the monster's only family right the monster is trying to teach Victor a lesson. He's trying to tell him, you abandoned me on my own, so my revenge is to abandon you. So the monster's not going to kill Victor right here, right? Because his beef is not with Elizabeth. He doesn't mind her. He doesn't have a problem with her. So he's not trying to teach her anything. What he's trying to teach Victor is see what I mean by I was miserable on my own right? And so for some reason, this thought never crosses Victor's head and he lets Elizabeth go off on her own. Well, sure enough, a couple minutes later, she's dead, right? It's horrific. And the way that Mary Shelley describes it is very sad, right? Victor has this agonizing, horrible moment where he sees his wife's body and he knows he's responsible for her death. And it's so incredibly sad. The townspeople have gathered to weep over her, right? But the monster's still there. Victor says, after that man, 
they can't catch him. He's a monster. We've, we've seen this before, people. We can't catch him. He's a monster. So Victor doesn't know what to do, but eventually he gets this idea in my mind. Let me go check on my dad, because I guess the monster's probably going to go there next to kill my dad. He's finally catching on to the pattern after all of this time, but the monster is not there and has not touched his brother or his father. But Victor has to tell his dad that Elizabeth is dead. And, and his dad falls into a deep depression, and they basically suggest that he dies of heartache, right, of sadness. And so now Victor has lost William, his little brother, Justine, his friend and family maid, Clairval, his best friend, his wife, Elizabeth, and his father, five to the monster, okay? And he's adding this up in his head. You know he is. So he, after his father's death, he falls into like some crazy state and they put him basically in an insane asylum, which he calls a dungeon. Back then they treated people with mental illness really poorly. So I'm sure it was like a dungeon. And he wakes up in the asylum and basically turns his mind to revenge. Okay. The end of the chapter is basically like a breaking point for Victor. He goes and he finally tells his story to someone. And just like he thought, the judge sees his kind of craziness over this subject and says, I think you're crazy. I'm not going to put all of my forces, all the police, everything I have into this story because I think that you're crazy. And he says it in a nice way, but Victor's like, no, I'm done. I'm handling this. It's over, right? And that's kind of how we end the chapter with him like, this is it. I'm I'm taking care of this, okay? So a couple of important things I want to point out. Again, as we get to the end, it's like the chapters get really meaty and have all this stuff, right? One thing I want you to point out or I want you to see in this book is the real question here is who is the monster? And obviously there's a monster. They call him the fiend, the demon, the creature, but then there's Victor, right? And at the end of the day, their stories are very parallel. Okay. The monster, he's alone, right? And he says, please, please give me a companion. I need it so much that I will destroy your life if you don't do it. And Victor refuses. And then at the end of chapter 13, or sorry, 23, I don't know why I said 13. Now, why didn't I put a note here? Okay. Okay, so the monster, he says, I've been alone my whole life. I'm miserable. Make me a companion. And I swear to God, if you don't, I will make your life miserable, right? I have one demand. Make me a companion, right? Victor gets to this point of loneliness. So many people he has lost. And he says this right here. You refuse my just demand. I have but one resource, and I devote myself either in my life or death to his destruction. Now, did the monster not do the exact same thing? He said, I have one demand, and if you don't meet it, I'm devoting my life to your destruction. That's exactly what the monster did. And he has proved his point to Victor. You left me alone. You gave me no one. You made me hideous so no one would love me, and now I'm angry. And the exact same thing happens to Victor. And he does not handle it any differently than the monster. So who is Mary Shelley trying to suggest is the real monster? That's your big thinking question. I'm going to post it on Google Classroom tomorrow. But I hope you've made it this far in the video. I'm sorry. I know I'm like on a soapbox about this. But... The reason why I think it's important at your age to read this book and not when you're older is that 
sometimes in life we spend so much time blaming other people for the tragedies in our life. And sometimes it's other people's fault. Sometimes it's no one's fault. But sometimes we've just done something wrong. And we have to own up to it. And we have to accept it. And we have to deal with it. And we have to move forward or else we become the monster, right? We have to deal with our problems. We have to talk about our emotions. We have to own up to our mistakes or else we become just like those things that we're scared of or those people we don't like. And I think that's so valuable here. And that's really why I wanted you to read this book. So again, thank you for listening to my rambling. Those of you who listen to these videos, I just love you. I'm sorry that I get so excited about this book. Um, I'm not sorry. Don't apologize for that. I love that I get so excited about this book. Um, and I love sharing it with you. Even if it's just five of you or six of you that are hearing this, I love sharing it with you. I hope you're having a great day. We're closing out on the end of the year. And I love you. Bye.